Well, tonight we are in lesson number 30 here, page 79 in our handouts here, as we look at another two, as we continue to kind of walk through these minor prophets and look at another, another two minor prophets, and we'll go another couple weeks here, and then we'll take a break as we roll into um, the New Testament stuff here. <coughs> Once again, as we go through these books, especially like these later prophetic books, these minor prophets, they're really very small books, two, three, four chapters kind of things. Um, and we have to be reminded that they're not in chronological order, even though we're, we're going through these right now. And I know that what I'm going to say tonight will sound an awful lot like what I might have said last week as we looked at some of the other prophets, because some of these prophets are overlapping each other. Uh, and we're going to see that again uh, tonight with these prophets, they overlap other prophetic books that we have talked about. And since they overlap one another, they're dealing with the same situations that are going on. It's, it's generally dealing either with the Assyrians, or it's dealing with the Babylonians, um, or it's dealing with um, the sin of either Israel in the northern kingdom, or uh, the sin of Judah in the southern kingdom. And so all these things start to overlap. So if you start reading through those, start reading through them and you start feeling like, all this is the same, it's because they are. If you were reading them chronologically, where you'd be reading through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles and then stop and read a particular prophet, it might not seem like it's just something repetitive over and over again. So you have to understand that as we read through there, um, as, you, as you're just kind of reading through the Bible from you know, cover to cover, it's not, it's not chronological order, so... Um, and as we teach through there, I know that's how, it, uh, that's how it feels because that's how it feels to me. I'm like, I'm saying the same things over and over again, talking about the Assyrians or talking about the Babylonians. And it's very much going to feel like that way tonight. I want to talk about these two prophets here, Nahum and uh, uh, Habakkuk, and just a little bit about what's going on with them. Nahum is a prophet, as we go through our text here, Nahum's a prophet and he lived during the reign of King Hezekiah. We know that King Hezekiah is... Uh, a good king of Judah. And so as the Assyrians were coming down, and as they were conquering the northern kingdoms, the northern kingdom, rather, the ten tribes, uh, they pushed further down, and they tried to start conquering surrounding cities in Judah, but they're, they're halted at Jerusalem. King Hezekiah is in there, prophet Isaiah, all that kind of stuff happens. God moves in a miraculous way and will destroy 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. Event, 2 Kings 19.35 uh, talks about that event here. We don't know a lot about Nahum and we don't really know a lot about Habakkuk when we get to him. We know what it just says from the beginning of, of Nahum 1.1, an oracle concerning Nineveh. When we talk about Nineveh, Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian kingdom. So he's not just talking about the city of Nineveh, but rather Nineveh representative of all of Assyria. We would talk about that sometimes like uh, what's going on in Washington, although we try to distance ourselves as Americans and say we're not what's going on in Washington. But the idea to the world would be what's happening in Washington is happening in the whole of the United States or whatever major city we might think about. Um, we might think about not necessarily just our capital city, but like, you know, so goes New York, the rest of the, the, rest of the nation or LA or whatever big major metropolis city you might think of. So when we, when we hear this talking about Nineveh, it's, it's really reflective of the greater nation. Now we know that Nineveh about 150 years prior to this is when Jonah is preaching to Nineveh and there's uh, a revival that takes place within Nineveh and we talked a little bit about that with the, when we went through the story of Jonah that maybe Nineveh, it seems that Nineveh's power might have uh, waned just a little bit during that time frame. Uh, you know, we don't see anything within the records of Assyrian records showing any kind of sparked revival but that's not uh, uncommon to see. They're not going to probably talk about them suddenly turning because of some preacher from, from Israel coming and telling them to turn, much like uh, Egyptian history doesn't mark 
uh, it doesn't talk about the Exodus, you know, uh, it doesn't talk about the negative things. And we also know, like, especially with Egyptian history, uh, where the incoming pharaohs had a tendency to rewrite the history of the pharaohs before them, chiseling out their carvings, chiseling their name on top of works that they did not do. And, and that makes it difficult sometimes to go back through secular records of these pagan nations and that kind of thing and try to lay that on top of the Bible because they weren't always honest uh, about the recording of their history. And so there's a lot of things where you can read biblical accounts in secular history laying on top of one another. And then there are sometimes stories um, where uh, the Bible will record an event, usually if it's negative to that kingdom, uh, they, don't, they don't record it. Like the Assyrians don't record uh, some of their, their failures. Obviously the Egyptians don't either. Uh, his writing serves a twofold purpose. The first of it is this. It declares the destruction to come upon Nineveh or Assyria, you might say, for all of her sinning. One of the themes that just kind of rides throughout these prophetic books is just that God is bringing or will be bringing judgment to those who sin. You cannot read the Old Testament and come away with the idea that God doesn't care about righteousness and that God doesn't care about sin. Uh, he does. He brings his judgment. And not only his judgment against pagan nations like uh, Assyria here, but his judgment against his own people when they've gone into idolatry and paganism and, and all the rest. The second part of the of his writing, not only is to declare about the destruction, because really when you read Nahum, there's no come to the Lord, there's no repentance kind of statements, which is in a lot of other uh, writings of the prophets, especially when those writings are to the people of God. It's, it's almost always repent and come back to me. But when he's writing about the pagan nations, other than like Jonah and a few other prophets, it's more God's judgments upon you. You, you, you've, you've just, you've lived in an unrighteous way, you have no care, concern for God, and now God's judgment's upon you. And the, and, the, and the book of Nahum is very much in there. So the second part of this is it gave comfort then to the people of Israel that their enemy, the Assyrians, is not going to prosper over them. So they'd already seen, they'd already seen the success that the Assyrians had with the northern tribes, 722 BC, they come in and conquer uh, the north. They deport the locals there. They import people, a very common thing. Um, and and they, they also know the violence that the Assyrians uh, used in their brutal, t in their tactics. It, just very, very brutal. Um, uh, I'm thinking of Shalmaneser the third. There was something that was written about him that it said that uh, he was known having having created a, a pyramid of the severed heads of the enemies that he had conquered and then stacked them up in front of the gate of the cities. And so there was this pyramid of these severed heads. And other Assyrian kings were known for just taking and stacking up the corpses that they have killed, just like. You know, cord wood that you, we would stack for firewood and stuff in front of the city gates. And if you look at any of the relief carvings, and you can Google these kind of things, and you just see the violence. A lot of times it was severing of heads, severing of hands, just very, very brutal tactics. And we still are seeing that today when you look at some of the stuff that ISIS does. It just, the reason they do that kind of stuff and cut off hands and cut off heads and stuff is because it is such a shock value to any civilized culture. And uh, the Assyrians did that to scare us. We would get terrified about things like that. When I was in the, when I was in the Marine Corps, and one of the things they talked about just after the first Gulf War, um, that the uh, Iraqi troops were being told about the Marines. They were, there was all kinds of terrible things they were telling about them and, and how they were so uh, vicious and violent and how they had to kill their firstborn to be in the Marine Corps. And all, I mean, just all these weird things that we know are, are not true, but they were just being told this kind of stuff. Um, I think it was to not necessarily terrify them, but to uh, kind of prep them for when the battle would take place, the fierceness of their enemy. And then when the Marines came and uh, they were fierce in battle, yes, but they found out they weren't what they were told. I told them they were so ticked off because they were put in the back of the little, little Amtrak that smelled like diesel fuel with you know, seawater coming in. They thought they were going to drown. When they finally opened those doors, they were ready to kick some butt. That's why they were so upset, you know. And uh, But anyway, um, probably shouldn't say but on the internet here. But anyway, I did. Sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, the point of that is, is what they said about them to kind of terrify their enemies. And the, the Assyrians did this to terrify them. And so here, here, the people in the south had saw their brothers 
taken off into captivity and now they're fear they're coming and God then uses Nahum to preach comfort to them don't be afraid about all of this God has this situation uh, under control and Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 it says the Lord is good a refuge in time of trouble he cares for those who trust in him but with an overwhelming flood he will make an end to Nineveh he will pursue his foes into darkness whatever they plot against the Lord he will bring to an end trouble will not come a second time so though they had saw this, uh, they could kind of read the, the writing on the wall. They could see the storm clouds gathering. They could kind of sense what was about ready to happen. They'd already seen their brother north destroyed. Then the prophet's coming and saying, don't worry about this because God's going to take care of them. And God does. It's not the Assyrians who come down and destroy the, the, the nation of Judah in the south. It's going to be the Babylonians. God's going to bring about some other destruction. And we're going to get to that when we get in the book of Habakkuk, but it's not going to be the Assyrians here. Number three is this. Nahum's name means comfort. It means comfort. And you see that roll over like in the New Testament city of Capernaum, right? We've talked about that a lot. We see that, that N-A-U-M uh, spelling in there. No, it's not exactly the same as his name, but it means the village of comfort. And you remember that Jesus spent a lot of time in that region and in the city of Capernaum where he would work a lot of miracles just bringing comfort to people. When you read about Jesus' ministry, which we will get to when we start looking at the New Testament books, there's, a, there's a, many themes that run in Jesus' life, um, in his ministry, but one of those things that it says constantly about Jesus is that when he looked on the people, that he had compassion for the people. And Jesus strives to bring comfort to the, to the widows, and he strives to bring comfort to the, to the children, and to orphans, and to just different things. One, you know, it, it wasn't all of his goal. His ultimate goal, really, right, is to die on the cross, to pay for the sins of the world. But even in doing that, he was working to bring just, just comfort to the people. And, just, and one of the things that I got this couple books about um, uh, handbooks of the ministry kind of thing and they walk you through like how to do weddings and how to do funerals and different stuff like that and there's a little section in both of them that just talks about comfort that one of the jobs um, uh, of, a, of a preacher of the gospel uh, is just to bring comfort to people it's all I mean it's, there's, there's times when you step on toes and we do that when we preach and when we teach but then there's times when you just you're, you're there to just bring some words of comfort when someone's gone through a tremendous loss or some tough suf su some tough suffering of some kind or something like that and so uh, Nahum was was uh, trying to do that I think to to the uh, people here Matthew chapter 11 verse 23 just a little passage to illustrate that you Capernaum will be Will you be lifted to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. And if the miracles that were performed in you have been performed in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Now that's a negative statement about this city because of how they rejected Jesus and how they rejected the comfort that he was trying to bring to the entire city and how they rejected his miracles and who he was. And Jesus then is saying, you know, if, if these old cities like Sodom that we think about, because we would think Sodom's like, you know, uh, uh, in ancient uh, Vegas or something like that, San Francisco or whatever, um, Jesus was saying, had they had what you had, they would have repented. They would still be around. And you have this in your midst and you're not doing anything anything with it. All right, number four is this. Nahum's writing against Nineveh follows 150 years after the prophet Jonah. I already mentioned this. Preaches, sparks the revival in the city. We talked about that um, maybe last, last week or a couple weeks ago. I guess a couple weeks ago, right? When, and I did the whole little Jonah was a prophet, ooh, ooh, you know, and that sort of thing. I won't, I won't repeat all of that. But we have some time now that has elapsed, which is a very preachable point here. And that is this. No revival lasts forever. You do not live on the mountaintop. There is always an ebb and flow to your life and to really to the life of any given church. There's, there's this excitement and then there's a pulling back and then there's a softening of excitement and then there's an apathy sometimes that comes in and then there's excitement. And that's why when I was a kid, we would have revivals every year, you know. Some of you remember them when you were younger. They probably ran a lot longer. By the time I was a kid, we were only having revivals for a week. I used to listen to the older people when I was younger. They would talk about in the good old days, everything was better in 1940 when smallpox and polio and all that was running rampant, but they said they were the good old days. 
everybody has a good old days. It's always the generation that was be before them. It was always better then. My kids someday are going to go, back in the good old days in 2015, when we had, you know, good music, not this junk they play today, but we'd always say back then, we used to have, they would talk about, we'd have revivals that run two or three weeks, we'd have tents set up and all, I'm like, yeah, you weren't competing with Little League football, Little League soccer, the internet, you know, you know 6,000 options with little video games, and the, there was nothing to do. But go watch the preacher holler and shout and foam at the mouth. So that's why we went to that sort of stuff. But now there's all these different options here. But the point of this is that, that no revival stays forever. And the moment after the revival's over, there's a, you know. You think about it in your marriage. Do you live the honeymoon all the years of your marriage? No. <laughs> No, this is why we talk about there's a honeymoon period, you know, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a week or so or a month or so or sometimes we talk about, uh, you know, that first year and then, but then you start to get to know the real person and some of the, the flaws of their personality start to become a little more evident, start to grate on you a little bit more and those kind of things there. And so then you kind of just get down to the life and there's sometimes it's really down in the depths and you're like, you're not my favorite person right now and then there's times when it's, uh, you know, happy and joyous again. It's like that in jobs. When you get into a job, we say there's a honeymoon period where you can't do anything wrong. Then there's a period when you can't do anything right. And so we have that ebb and, ebb and flow. And that happened in Nineveh. Though there was a revival, it did not stay. It did not stick. And Nineveh is not the only one. There would be revivals in, in Judah, but they would not stay. There would be small sparks of revivals in other times, in, in Israel, but not as a whole of a nation, but it doesn't stay. The whole book of Judges is about that. There's revival, and then there's an apathy, and then there's back into captivity, and they call out to God, and there's a revival, and it's just this cycle, and it happens at least six or seven major times with uh, about six major judges. There's some minor judges within, within that book. So no revival ever stays, and that's the same that happened with the Assyrians, and, and particularly with the city of Nineveh. Number five is this. Nahum's writings show two, excuse me, two distinct lists of some of the attributes of God as both the heavenly father and the just judge. Let me just read through this list here and then kind of break out some of the things. And, and I didn't come up with all of these. Uh, they were taken from Henrietta Mears' book, um, what the Bible is all about, and I've, I keep plugging it because it's just a good little book to, to read through to try to understand, okay, who is this prophet, what's the time frame in which they're preaching, and what are some of the major things going on. It's, it's a great, great uh, little book there. So, <clears throat> Nahum 1 verse 2 it says, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the seas and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, and the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. When we think about God as we look through this thing and we look at him as a loving father, there's some things that are stated about him that we can see that he's slow to anger. Being slow to anger is not the same as not ever getting angry. We have to understand that even though God is slow to anger, it means there is a time when God does get angry. And we read about that not only against foreign nations who were attacking his people, but we see God get angry at his own people. And we even see God get angry at his prophets. Did God not get angry at Moses? Yeah, he did. It says that God's anger burned against Moses. In fact, there was a time when God was going to smite Moses because he hadn't circumcised his sons. And it was his wife that had to circumcise his sons so that God's anger would go away. You remember that story. Or maybe you don't, but you can go back and read it because it happened. And then God's anger burns against the nation of Israel. And God wants to destroy them. And God has to intervene. Uh, or Moses intervenes and says, oh, please don't destroy them. If it, you have to, take me. But don't destroy them. They're just ignorant. And so there's times when God's anger has burned against individuals and God's anger. So 
being slow to anger is not the same as not getting angry at all. Anger is an emotion that God has. It's also an emotion that we have. We tend to get angry and become sinful in our anger. Where God has a righteous anger, Jesus displays a righteous anger where he's angry at sin, he's angry at injustice and things like that. But we let our anger, it, though it may start with that, it may start with injustices and things like that, we let that spill over into negative things in our life where we become just as indignant. I say something that's not, can't, I can't support it biblically, but I say, if you want to roll like a pig in the mud, I do not mind rolling like a pig in the mud with you, you know, in an argument. You know, some people, you know what I'm talking about. Some people raise the bar to where it's like, okay, if we got to go low, I don't mind going low, you know. <laughs> like, um, you know, some people say when they, when, when they go low, you know, you're supposed to go high and you're supposed to take the high road. And, 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 and yeah, we should do that. There's some times where I'm like, I'll go low with you because that's just, you know, I don't think that's in the Bible. Jesus isn't saying do that. I wouldn't tell you to follow my footsteps in that way. But that's what I'm saying when our anger differs in from God's anger because our anger spills over into different things. God is also talked about as being good. It says the Lord is good. How do you define what good is? We only really can define good when we put it up against something that is bad. And that's why Jesus, when he asked the question, when the guy came to him and said, good teacher, Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one's good except God. Because when we are judged against ourselves, we, might, we, we, someone, we always judge against someone who's worse than us. I'm better than Charles Manson. Well, the bar wasn't set very high if I did that, you know. You know, I'm more honest than Bernie Madoff. Well, I didn't set the bar too high, you know. Uh, I'm, more tr I'm more truthful than a politician, you know. But you, you start saying, like, uh, I'm more uh, compassionate than Mother Teresa, who's gone on to be with the Lord. People might go, I don't know about that, you know. I have more integrity than Billy Graham, I don't know about that, you know. When we start putting ourselves against some of the very best of our society, some of the very best of people in Christianity, now, and when we put ourselves against Jesus, we look like reprobates. We look terrible. Only he is good. Everything else compared to him then is bad. Number three is this, when it talks about him, a stronghold in the day of trouble. A refuge, as it talks about, a refuge in times of trouble or a stronghold. It is that place where you can go when the wind is beating down the door. Now, since we've all just come through the hurricane, right? Some of you stayed in your homes, maybe. Some of you may have went to shelter. I don't, I don't know. But we stayed down in our home. And, uh, you know, the idea was, I thought, I think this home will hold. <laughs> now... I had no reason to put any faith in this. I had never tested any of it, but I just thought that it would hold. And then when that wind went, whoosh, and I could hear the whole house creak and creak, you know, then it's like, Lord, today might be the day. Find me ready. You know, those are the prayers that, that I'm saying in my mind, you know, when this whole thing collapses, I'm seeing the trees go vertical and things like that. But generally, our home is the place where we can bar everyone out. I don't have to listen to anyone pick on me anymore. I don't have to listen to anyone complain anymore. I don't have to deal with anything. You know, we have those feelings that God is that stronghold. When we can come into the presence of God, we can let some, lot, all those other things slip away and just be protected by him. And that's what David talked about that all the time in his psalms and his prayers he talked about how god is his shield how god is his stronghold as god is his tent god is the person who is covering over and watching over him and that's what a loving father does you know it's like i don't know if when you were little kids did you ever say my dad can beat up your dad you know it was that idea that my dad can protect me and he can beat up on your dad which may or may not be true but we always seem to think it as kids that, that our parents are, can always protect us and our dad is, the, is like the chief protector. He's the one that can just defend us against anything. Well, we have a heavenly father who really is, can beat up anybody else who's trying to, to hurt us. And he will defend us. The fourth thing that we can see from this is knowing that, um, knowing him and trusting in him. I don't even know why I wrote it the way I wrote it, knowing them that trust him, but... 
God knows, I like that passage where it's like, it talks about not only knowing God, but that we are known by God. There's a big difference between saying, well, I know God, but does, does God know you? You know? Because that is what's more important, because in the Bible, Jesus says, away from me, I never knew you. They clearly knew him because they said, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do all these things? He said, yeah, but go away from me. I never knew you. And so how did he not know them? Because they didn't have a relationship with him. They acted like they knew him. They acted like they were on the team. But they didn't get into a relationship with him where they read his word and prayed to him and, 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 and had a meditation upon his word and just, and just were silent and let God speak. These ways in which God says, this is how I will come to know you. The Bible says that, that we are known by our fruit. Maybe he didn't know them because they had no fruit to produce. Or they produ not that they didn't have fruit to produce, but that they produced no fruit. Because everyone has the ability to produce fruit if the Spirit is in you. The very fruit of the Spirit comes out. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no measure, right? And so, you know, I, I talked about my friend from Kentucky and how he knew... Um, uh, Ed Rouse. He said he knew Ed Rouse. He was going to get a picture with Ed Rouse. I told you this story before, a couple weeks, ago, maybe a couple months ago, in a sermon. And so when they had this road rally that came through uh, Maysville because it, that that route. Uh, the highway would happen to be on this road route. And so all these old cars came in racing. And there, here comes Ed Rouse. And he's got people around him, Rouse racing and all this kind of stuff. Big name in racing stuff and, and uh, uh, hopped up car parts. And, and my friend, you know, he's like, gives the camera to my dad and says, you know, I want you to take a picture of me and Ed Rouse over there. And so Ed Rouse is talking with some friends. And, and my buddy, he comes over and he's, just gets real close to Ed Rouse. Ed Rouse doesn't even know who he is. He ain't even talking to him. He's just over there. And my dad get ready to take the picture. And then he go, oh, no, wait, wait, wait. He's over there. Yeah, okay, take the picture now. You know, that kind of thing. So my dad takes a picture. Now, if you saw the picture, you'd think that he knew Ed Rouse. Because Ed Rouse just happened to be looking, smiling. Here's my friend. And, and you know, they don't know each other. I mean, if, if that picture was sent to Ed Rouse, he said, who is this idiot over here? This is bumpkin, country bumpkin in my picture. Cut him out, crop him out. I look good, get rid of that guy. That's the idea. Sometimes we go, take a picture. I'm real close to Jesus. I went to church. I came out the church doors. I was holding my Bible. I've never opened it up. I don't even know the first book or the last book, but I had my Bible. Look good. Spine's never even been creased or broken. You know, that's that idea of we don't know. But God, God knows those who know him. God knows us as a heavenly father. It's like a heavenly father who knows his kids. Sometimes I don't feel like a very good dad. Well, a lot of times, to be honest, don't feel like a good dad because there are things about my kids I do not know. I cannot consistently, regularly, correctly remember my daughter's birth date. Now, yeah, well, some of you can't remember your own birth date, so don't get upset with me, you know? I all, I'm always off by one day. For some reason, I picked the wrong day one time, and now that wrong day is like stuck in my mind. And when I get so nervous, when Katie will ask me, when's my birthday? I'm afraid I'm going to say the wrong day, and I do. In fact, when I went to open up a bank account, I opened it up on the wrong birth date. <laughs> and then it caused a lot of problems when he had to go back and change it because then I, I told him the right one. They're going, uh-uh, that's not the right It was a mess. It was a mess. And uh, so, anyway, I, I, struck, I struck. Do not ask me for her birthday because I'll probably get it wrong. You know, and like things that they like and things that there's just things about them that I don't know. But a heavenly father, he knows. He knows everything about you. He knows who you are. He knows what you think. He knows how you feel. He knows the fears you have. He knows the successes that you want. He knows the failures that haunt you. He knows he knows. All right, let's move to the second portion of this here, and that is when we talk about him as the just judge. It talks about how he is jealous. God does not want to share you with anybody, and he will not share you with anybody. The Bible talks about that our God is a jealous God, which means he wants all of us, which is kind of interesting because we know that with inside of us, there's a portion of us that's not good, Right? We know that inside of us, there's a portion of us that's not faithful. We know inside of us, there's a portion of, of us that is uh, whatever. You can go through the whole list. God wants the whole thing. He wants the whole thing. 
And I think that the reason he wants the whole thing is because he can make good out of any of it. He can take your most righteous stuff, which is like filthy rags to him, but he'll do something with it. And he can take the bad things in your life and he can cover those with grace and he can extend mercy and he can wash you of those things so that now he can display another part of himself and, the, and he can use that to do something good with it. God is a jealous God. He is not willing to share you with anybody. And so you just have to understand that. It's like a good spouse that says, I'm not sharing you with anybody. You're my wife, you're my husband, and I'm not sharing you with anybody. Just mine and mine alone. He is avenging. I love this about God. Because I have been in situations where I could not defend myself to my attackers. You ever been in that situation? Didn't matter what I said, I could never convince anybody that this is not what really happened. It happens a lot in the church. Somebody says something about you, someone gets mad, they talk about you, they quit, they leave, they go off or whatever. And you want to tell them, that's not how it really happened. What really happened was this. Let me tell you what they really said. <laughs> go, down, go down that list. You can't go down that list. You can't do that sometimes. And not only in the church, it happens in other places. It happens in business. It happens in whatever. And, and so sometimes it gets very frustrating because you want, you want to avenge yourself. And you can't, and that's why God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Sometimes we just have to defer to God and say, God, you know what's going on. Because when he does, he will not go further than necessary. When we want to get vengeance, we always want to get vengeance and then some, right? We never want to balance the scales. We want the scales to always be in our favor. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't know if you're that way, but that's how I am when I think, I don't think, well, if you flatten my tire, I want to flatten two of yours, you know? I want to get back, and then I want to teach you a lesson, because I feel that's my job, to teach you a lesson. Don't mess with me. That's why I say I'll roll like a pig in the mud with you. I don't mind. And that's not good. You know, we, so, but God is a God of vengeance. He is going to bring things into balance. And so sometimes, when we sit and think, God, why are you letting all this stuff go? People are talking about you. People are defaming your name. People are, are, are ridiculing and mocking your writing and your ways and your righteousness. All this stuff. God, when are you going to move? I just sometimes want to see God slap down some bad people. You know? When someone gets up there and says, well, God this and God that. I just want to see God. And then people say, don't say God no more. You know? But that's not how God moves. But there is coming a day, and you can read about it in the book of Revelation, where God pours out vengeance. And it isn't even a struggle. It's like, hey, he took him, he cast him in the lake of fire, and he was destroyed. When you read about Satan, that's how he ends. It isn't like this arm wrestling match where God's like, oh, I'm trying to get the snake. and It just says that he took him and he cast him in the lake of fire. I mean, just dip, dip, whew, like a piece of trash. It's over with. But we talk about, like, God's got to wrestle it. You just, you just read it for yourself and see if you don't come to the same conclusion. Because I read it, I'm like, it's like God says, I'm done with you. <laughs> done. Okay, next. Oh, I'm done with that. <laughs> that. Next. Okay. And then he gathers his children and off into heaven. It's not even a struggle. But God is an avenging God. He is filled with wrath at evildoers. You see that in Revelation. You see it in other times in the Old Testament when God will pour out... There's a wrath that comes on evilness, and that's why I heard, um, oh, his name has now escaped me. I can see his face. Anyway, wouldn't matter. He was preaching at the North American a couple years ago, and in the adult Bible study, and he was talking about righteousness, and what his focus was, I wish I could remember his name, he, 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 uh, wore, he moved to Pepperdine University now. Um, Jeff Walling, Jeff Walling, and uh, so anyway, Jeff Walling, he was, he was a, a preacher in our sister division, non-instrumental churches, some of you know about that history within our churches, and uh, out in California and whatnot. Anyway, so he was preaching about righteousness, and he said, you know, we have this idea of preaching about the grace of God, and we just come to God as we are, and all these kind of things. He says, I think God cares about holiness, and we sing the song, well sometimes we don't, now we don't really sing anymore, but holy, 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 it's the Lord God Almighty, you know. And his thing was, do we even ever stop to think about coming into the presence of a holy God? Now I'm not one to, to talk necessarily about clothing and that all of that necessarily matters, 
maybe somewhat. We put on our best to go out on a fancy date, but we don't put on our best to come and worship the Lord because we say, well, God just wants me to come, you know, cool and collective and relaxed and everything like that. Well, maybe. But you don't put, most people don't, maybe in Florida you do, but you don't generally put flip-flops on and cut off jeans and go to your wedding. You know, we get all dolled up. Why? Because we want to look the best that we can for our bride, our groom, our friends, you know. And, I, and I'm not saying dress is everything, but I'm just saying the attitude, and he was talking about the attitude that God cares about holiness, and we have to understand because God pours out wrath on evildoers. Now, I understand as Christians, this is not condemnation, but we are accountable for what we're doing. We do need to turn back to the Lord. I mean, God does care. Paul understood that because Paul said, do, you know, uh, that our grace is not a liberty to license. Shall grace abound? You know, Paul talked about we have grace. Should, that, should, should we sin all the more so that grace abounds? That's what Paul asked. Should we sin so that grace increases? And he uses the absolute strongest Greek wording of, of the negative that he can to say, we translate it as absolutely not, but you might translate it in, in Kentucky language like, ain't never ever going to happen, no how. You know what I'm saying? You just put as many negatives as you possibly can together. You have so many negatives, it becomes a positive. You know, you know what I'm saying? It, he uses the strongest negative to say, absolutely not. Just because we have grace does not mean I can go out and sin just so that God's grace can increase because then we don't understand grace and we certainly don't understand the righteousness and the holiness of God. Understand this, that God will fulfill his wrath against evildoers. The fourth thing we see about judges is he maintains wrath against his enemies. God is going to bring things into account. His judgment that's going to come, he's telling Nahum here, Nineveh is, is, I know it looks like they're getting away with everything, but there's coming a day when Nineveh will end. We know that happened because is Nineveh around? Is Assyria around anymore? It's not. It's, it's destroyed. You know, are the Babylonians around anymore? No. And you can go through other, are the Romans around anymore? No. I mean, there's a, and, and I dare say there'll be a day when people will go, are the Americans around anymore? No. I think, that, I, I think that there could come a day when that will happen because every great nation has fallen. And I don't think that we are any less susceptible to that. God maintains his wrath against it. There were several times in the Bible where you can read where it says, God says, I will not relent from this. He might postpone it. He might delay it, but he will not relent from it. He will, he's going to bring about his wrath. The, the, the fifth thing we see is he is great in power. Never underestimate the power of God. I mean, if he is the God, sometimes we forget this. I, I, I don't know why we do. I do myself. I don't know why we forget the power of God. What has God created? And let's think about what are some of the everythings in creation? What are some of the amazing things of creation to you? Let's just call them out. Yell out one of them. The universe, okay? What in the universe is amazing? Okay, that would be in the earth, but... Solar system, stars, planets, black holes, these... What's that? The infiniteness of it all, the vastness of it all, the darkness of space. I mean, these things are amazing to us. I love if you've seen any of the pictures from the Hubble telescope and all those different things, black holes, stuff I can't even understand. And, you know, Louis Giglio does a great job of all that. It's a little old now because it's been overused so much. But it talks about the vastness and Betelgeuse and all these different things. Um, and so, okay, the universe. What, what else is amazing? You said the mountains. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> what do you find amazing? the way things would be. The perfect structure of that, especially with our planet, if it was kilt, kilted a little more on its, ass, on its axis. <laughs> well, that's Kentucky preaching for you. It was a little kilted on its rear end, all right? But if it's tilted a little bit more on its, on its I'm not even going to try to say it again because I, I know I'm going to say it wrong. Uh, anyway, if we would get too hot or we get too cold or we couldn't even preach. You know what I'm saying? We can't, we can't speak. Anyway, um, the amazement of God. And I think about the power of God. And that power is for you. 
if you're a child of his. What, that's, why the, that's why the psalmist writes, if God be for us, who can be against us? But I tend to think, as you probably tend to think, God can't get, God, God can't get me through this one. He can't overcome that. We were talking about temptations on Sunday morning Sunday school. We think about the power of God. And sometimes we go, God can't overcome this one. God can't get me through that. His love. His love is amazing. Look at how hard it is for us to love people. How hard it is for us to love those who even love us. Let alone love those who don't love us. And God loves even what we would consider the unlovable. Because God's love does what's right regardless of how it is responded back to him. Number six is this, he will not leave guilty unpunished. I kind of talked about that a little bit, but the guilty are going to deal with stuff. The only way that we're not is when the guilty like us come under the grace of Christ. Being declared not guilty and innocent, you know, are not the same, right? We are not, you know, God will declare us not guilty, but that doesn't make us innocent of our sin. It means God is removing the guilt of our sin. He is taking the punishment. He is taking the payment of that. And I think that is an amazing thing. We look at that with little kids. Little kids are innocent. They didn't knowingly do anything wrong. There's an innocence about them. We go, they're innocent. But, but a 12-year-old who steals, you don't go, oh, they're innocent. They're guilty. You may take that guilt away. You may not punish them. You may talk about them, extend to them grace. But they're not innocent. Not anymore. They know evil now. They know wrong. God removes the guilt. And the last thing is, is he is indignant. And, and what I mean by that, in, is, as I understand, is looking through the text here, indignant towards sin, indignant towards evilness. It just, when I think about indignance, it's something that just bristles your skin. Makes you just, Ugh! sometimes I just say it like I need to say it. You know what I'm saying? Prophets preached like that sometimes. If you could hear the actual Jewish language, you would hear them say some pretty strong words that might even borderline on some vulgarity in their preaching to, 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 to talk about the stench of sin and, and, the, and the repulsiveness of sin. And we don't do that sometimes because we, we, we dumb things down and, and we soften everything in precious moments, our sermons and stuff like that. And, um, you know, sometimes I felt like this, like growing up in a church, we didn't talk about issues. And for a long time, even now, some churches still struggle with this. Uh, you know, we didn't talk about marriage issues. We didn't talk about sex issues. We didn't talk about uh, immorality issues and all that kind of stuff. We want to we just, you know, soften all that sort of stuff. I don't know why, because your kids are not softening all that stuff when they're talking about it. It's as blatant and vulgar and foul is anything, you know, and I'm not saying we have to be that way, but we do have to be straightforward with those things and talk about those things. God was indignant towards sin. Let's move on to this book here of Habakkuk in the 15 minutes that we have left. Just as Obadiah spoke against Edom, we talked about that several times ago, Nahum's going to speak against Israel. Habakkuk will prophesy against Babylon. The next major power that's going to come on the scene here. Assyrians, then we have the Babylonians are going to come on the scene there. Because the Assyrians kind of battle with the Egyptians. The Egyptians get beat back in, I think it's, uh, I think the battle's called Carchemish. Uh, uh, King Josiah is killed in that battle. And they push uh, Egypt all the way down to Egypt's borders. Because Egypt was kind of battling against there. And, and they're going to lose out eventually to Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar, Nabopolassar, and Nebuchadnezzar are going to come over and, and conquer them. Number two is this. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah and Daniel. You think about them. Jeremiah say, stays and preaches about the destruction of, of uh, Jerusalem. He sees it. He talks about it. We think that he, he, uh, he actually witnessed all that. He goes down into Egypt. Daniel's taken into Babylonian captivity. He doesn't see the destruction of Jerusalem because he's in that first wave. Habakkuk is among these prophets here. There is some talk about him. It's just fable. We believe that because of the, the uh, apocryphal book of Bell and the Dragon that talks about Habakkuk bringing um, comfort to Daniel in the lion's den. But that's not, that wasn't a, a book that was canonized and if you know anything about how that happened, where um, the, uh, the, the, the religious leaders, church leaders, early uh, church fathers, and, and before that, um, 
scribes, Pharisees, those people, teachers of the law, would read these books and then they would have a criteria that they would ask about the books and see if they measured up, did they know the author, were they widely uh, uh, disseminated, you know, time frame, do they meet with other, other uh, thoughts and stuff with the Bible. And there was books that measured up and books that didn't measure up. And the books that measured up, they canonized, which meant just to see together. They saw these things together. And so by the time Jesus comes along, we have the Old Testament canon. It's already been translated into the Greek language, which we call the Septuagint. And uh, then the New Testament is canonized. So the, the book there of Bell and the Dragon was not canonized. It wasn't seen by the most um, conservative, shall we say, of of scholars, but it was a book that was around. And if you sometimes I think, like if you get a Catholic Bible, you will see that in there, and other Bibles. Even that very early first King James Bible had the apocryphal books printed uh, uh, in them. So anyway, we don't hold to the rest of that. But he was a contemporary of these two prophets here. He saw the destruction of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. He saw the deportation of his fellow countrymen off in the Babylon. So when Daniel and um, uh, I, I always remember their their pagan names: Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, it, someone help me with their Jewish names, Ezariah, Mishael, and Hananiah. Uh, <coughs> anyway, taken off into Babylonian captivity. Number three is this. The book of Habakkuk might be summarized in the question of why. How many of you ask God the question why? Me. I'm sure you do too. I always ask God, why? Why me? Why now? Why this way? Why that person? Why this subject? Why this? Why that? I always hear that, that heavenly because. <laughs> because, because, yeah. Sometimes it's not even because I said so, it's just because. <laughs> Why God? Because. <laughs> and that angelic, deep, you know, James Earl Jones, God voice. Because. I don't hear the voice of God like that. But here's, a way, here's one way it can be seen, or really basically two ways. Once again, I didn't come up with these. I'm just sharing with some other authors that come up with. One of them is watch and see. When he asks why, God's, God's uh, uh, as he lays out the book, it's watch and see. And I think that that's a, a, a great answer for us. When we say God, God says just watch and see. You ever had someone say, what are you doing? You just, just wait a minute. Just watch and see. When I build things, Michelle and I have two different abilities. I can see things in my mind. It cannot spell out words in my mind, and I can't do math too well in my mind. But I can visualize concept in my mind. Wheels turning, cogs doing this, make something spin, a rope goes down, a little chain ball falls, you know, all those, all those, what do you call them, Goldberg devices. I can see all that in my head. <whistles> Ding! The egg cracks and fries in the pan. You know, I can see all that and do that. Michelle can't see that. She, so when we're building something, I'm like, I'm going to take out this wall, I'm going to put a, th this here, I'm going to put a door in there, I'm going to run some pipe down here, and then I, I just start swinging the sledgehammer, dust is flying, Michelle just cringing because she can't see all that. And I always say, just trust me. It, it, it'll, you'll start to see it. She can't see it. You know, she can't see it. It's hard for her to trust me in those things there. God, huh? I can't blame you because <laughs> I'm like that Tim Taylor thing where it's like, I could cut it with a little hammer like this, but what fun would that be? I want a 20-pound sledge. Boom, you know, poof. And then you're like, oh, well, now we've got to redo two rooms, you know. Uh, but anyway, I think God's that way. Sometimes we're just like, God would just say, just trust me. I'm working in your life. I'm doing something in this relationship. I'm working in something over here. I'm working with your kid over here. I'm working with your kid's teacher over there. I'm working... Just kind of wait and see. The other thing is stand and see. Not only to wait on God's timing, but just stand back and let God move. You ever told someone, you get ready to do something, you're like, stand back. Stand back. Let me stretch out a little bit here. I'm going to run the race. You know what I'm saying? When we were down in Mexico um, on this missions trip when I was... Uh, when, I, when I was in Kentucky, and we went down to a, tr a trip in Mexico, one of the things we had to do was we had to dig a septic, a septic cyst, uh, hole for their septic tank, and then we were going to lay up the block and everything. And, and he wanted it to be eight feet square. Eight feet, eight feet, eight feet. If you've ever been to Mexico, it's like digging through concrete. I mean, that, that, I mean Texas is like Mexico, okay? So you know what I'm talking about. Well, the ground is dry, dry, dry. And it's just hardened. And so we were down about six feet, six feet square. 
And I was getting tired. of We had dug for two days. And we were putting the dirt into a little bucket and then lifting it up and dumping it out and come back. And that's how we had to do it because we didn't have it. So after 666, I thought, this is good enough. Satan's number, I got it. But 666 is good enough. All you're going to do is go to the bathroom in here. Satan, this is good enough for him. You know, he's already the king of the dung pile anyway. That's all you're going to drop in this. So just let it be. Well, the, the, the grandfather of the guy that we were building the house for, the grand, or, or maybe, not, maybe it wasn't the grandfather, it might have been his dad. His dad comes, and we, I can't speak Spanish, and he can't speak English, and, and he just kept going, ocho. I was like, no, I didn't even know how to say six. I was like, six. And he said, ocho. Well, there was a pickaxe there. Now, I know this isn't proper Spanish, but I said, ocho. Pico. <laughs> I told him, you want Ocho? You swing the Pico, okay? <laughs> so he says, <laughs> picks up that pick, and he, he just swings real rhythmically. I mean, like, I'm like, cooch, cooch, you know, just wearing myself out. He just picked up that thing. And he just did it like, I mean, this guy had obviously done it for a long time. And he digs up the thing. He, he, after about 20 minutes, he had gotten a pretty significant pile. He put the pick down. He said, Ocho. I was like, I was like, okay, you know. So we finished watching it, you know. Sometimes there's some people that just say, stand back. Just stand back and watch me. And then there's a kneel and see. And the idea of kneel and see is, is to just, Pray before God. Humble yourself before God. That's why I put over on the other side, watch and see, there's this person wrote it like this. I can't remember who the author was. I stole this from. But the burden, the vision, and the prayer. Stand, see what God's doing, the vision of it all. Watch the burden that is upon us. And then the kneel, just just pray. Just pray to God and then see what God does. I'm really, really bad at this. Maybe some of you are too. When a when a problem arises, instead of just praying to God and then saying, you know what, I prayed to God, I put it in his hands, I'm going to back off and just let God move. I pray to God, put it in his hands, and I take it out of his hands and try to fix the problem myself. And I say, God, help me with this problem. I pray to you, you haven't moved fast enough, so I'm just helping you so you know how you're supposed to answer this prayer. How many of you are with me? Some of you? Yeah. We need to back off a little bit. All right, number five. Habakkuk questions God about the injustice of the people of Judah and why God has not answered his prayer. Now look at this. See if it doesn't remind you of a prayer that you might have. How long, O Lord, must they call for help? But you do not listen. Most of us could stop right there and say, God, how many times have I prayed? And say, God, please, 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 please. And it's just like you are too busy to listen. How long, God, are you going to be silent or cry out to you? Violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. What he is saying is, how long, God, are you going to let this happen? Everywhere I look, I see another gun shooting. Everywhere I turn on the news, there's someone who did something wrong. A kid that was abducted. Sex trafficking going on. Someone cheated someone. Someone stole something. Some disaster fell somewhere. And I just say, God, how long am I going to have to look at all of this terrible stuff in this world? And you are not listening. Or at least you're not responding. And I would say that about everybody in this room has had some prayer like that, maybe not as indignant as I'm demonstrating it right now, maybe more so. But you have asked God, God, how long are you going to let these people attack my family? How long are you going to let this person say something about my child? How long are you going to let this, this disruption be in my business? How long are you going to let this evil be in our town? We're asking those questions, and he was asking that question because he could see all these terrible things that were going on in his own country, where the priests had given up on following the things of God, where the people had followed the ways of the priests who had given up on following the things of God. God's answer is watch and see. The Babylonians were on the rise, and they would soon come and destroy Judah for her wickedness. That was not the answer he wanted. Habakkuk 1.6, he says, I am raising up the Babylonians. 
That's like saying, I am raising up these ruthless warriors over here who are bloodthirsty and hungry and want to kill. That ruthless and impetuous people, he says, who sweep across the whole earth and seize dwelling places not their own. Now, if, if, you were, if your kid asked you, Dad, how long do I have to wait until you do something? You say, don't worry about it. I'm, 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 I'm training this pit bull over here and I'm going to release him on you in about three days. Don't worry about it. Things are going to change. He's going to go maul you to death. And you're not going to be bored one bit anymore because you'll see Jesus. I mean, that's kind of the answer that Habakkuk has when he asks how long. And he says, don't worry. I'm, I'm raising up this pit bull over here. It's called King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. <laughs> that is not the answer that he wanted. Habakkuk is taken back, number seven. He's taken back by God's use of such a vile nation to bring punishment to Judah and questions how a holy God can do such a thing. Have you ever heard people say, how can a holy God do this? When 9-11 happened, how can a holy God do that? When, um, was it Katrina the, that came through New Orleans? The, the, uh, you know, how can God do that? Uh, what was the one that just hit Houston? Uh, Harvey, how can God do that? Irma, and look at, you know, how can God do, I mean, everything bad, God gets it. But anything good, no one gives credit to God. Oh no, that was, that was, that was good-hearted men, that was good business people, we were so, you know, it wasn't God. But something bad happens, oh, that was God. And when he hears this answer, his thing is, how can a holy God do something? What is the problem with that question? What is the, what is the uh, fundamental problem with him asking this question? Absolutely. He is assuming that he understands what true holiness is. He is defining it and he is placing God within his definition of holiness. Can you define the holiness of God? I can't. That's why the very word, when we use it against holiness, it means set apart. S something that is different. God is different. When we say God is holy, 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 we are saying God is different, different, different. There is nothing like him. That's why the Bible says who can be compared to him. No one is like him. There, there is nothing that you can even, there's no simile. There's no, there's, no, there's no comparison. There's nothing that you can go, this is sort of like God. The strongest relationship that we can somewhat use and it falls very, very short is when we talk about the father-child relationship. God uses that. That's why we call, we call him the father. God's not a sexual being. But he's talked about in a masculine way as a father because it's the only relationship that we can even possibly to, to try to draw together. But even that falls very short because sometimes our earthly fathers stink. So our heavenly father never does. So his holiness in there. Habakkuk 1 verse 12 says, Oh Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my holy one, we will... Uh, we will not die, O Lord. You have appointed them to execute judgment. O rock, you have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? He's saying, you can't handle uh, evilness and all this. Then why are you letting the more evil person than us come and destroy us, your chosen people? It makes no sense. Once again, it's his vantage point. Were the Babylonians created in the image of God? The people. Absolutely. Wayward though they were. How many of you saw the movie The Shack? A, a pretty, pretty interesting movie. I wasn't sure how I liked, you know, that the whole God the Father was a woman and all that. But when you look past it and she explains why, and I totally get it because he had an issue with his dad. So God doesn't come to him as a dad because he would reject him. That's why he used... But did you notice when he really needed to deal with the toughest thing in his life, which was finding his daughter, I'm, I'm letting this out if you haven't seen the movie, it's finding his daughter's body. You remember what he says? He comes, in, it's, it's the guy that plays like an, he's like an Indian guy, right? He says, there are some things you need a father for. And he comes as the heavenly father to find her, to help him bury her, the, the, the toughest part of the whole show. But the thing that, I, that struck me about that was how much hatred he had for his dad. And, and he couldn't let that go. And so then he says to the, the father, right, who's in this, uh, kind of like Paul, taken up, you know, in this vision or whatever. He says, well, you have two sons. You have a daughter who's doing some things wrong and you have a son who's doing some things wrong. Now you choose which one I'm going to keep and which one's going to be cast from hell. 
Now, he loves the daughter, but she's got some things wrong. She's being dishonest and stuff like that. And the son, he's kind of being dishonest. And, and he sees all these things. And he says, I can't choose. And he says, well, how can you not choose? Because they're both, they're both doing wrong things. He says, I can't choose because I love them. He loves them in spite of the wrong things they're doing. And then it hit me. I'm like, God loves all his children, even the rapists, the murderers, the vilest of individuals. He hates what they're doing, but they're his child creating his image and he loves them and he wants them to quit. We can't see that because we go, that guy should die. That lady should have this. Habakkuk struggling with this because he's like, God, we're good people. They're bad people. We deserve blessing. They deserve to be burned. Throw down fire, hailstone, destroy them. He struggled with that, and we do too. Now, there's something to be said about righteousness and justice that needs to be rendered. But God has a love even for the wayward. That's why we love the prodigal son story, because God doesn't stop loving the prodigal son. He doesn't go with them but he doesn't stop loving him. We love that because we know that we are all, from time to time, the prodigal son, the wayward son. All right, man, I'm running long. Number eight, Habakkuk does not understand the answer from God, but declares this, I will stand and see what his rebuke will be. And God will declare that the Babylonians or that Babylon is not righteous, and in the end, she will come to a great fall. Look what he says in Habakkuk 2, 4. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright. He's talking about Babylon in reference maybe the king, but in, in reference to the whole city, or the whole nation rather. But the righteous will live by faith. He's puffed up and all, but faith is what I'm looking for. So don't think that I'm selecting this guy because he's powerful. Faith is what I'm looking for in people. And then he comes to Habakkuk 2, verse 16. You will be filled with shame. Now he's talking about Babylon here. Be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it's your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup of the Lord's right hand is coming around you and disgrace will cover your glory. He says, yeah, there's a time when you're reigning big dog supreme. But there's coming a time when you're going to be knocked off the mountain. You're not going to be king of the mountain. And sure enough, they're knocked off. And the Medo-Persians are knocked off. And the Greeks are knocked off. And the Romans are knocked off. And you can go down through the, the, uh, uh, the Ottoman Turk empires and the Mongolian, Mongolian empires. All these different things have been knocked off. It just, it, if you think you're on top of the mountain, that's the problem. Once you get on the top... The, you know, people said this, when you're, the problem about being a leader is once you become a leader, then everybody's target's on your back. Once you're at the top, everybody's gunning for you. And you're going to get knocked off. I mean, when I was a kid, who would, who would ever thought anyone beat Mike Tyson? But Evander Holyfield came around there and knocked him. And then who thought who would beat him? And no one remembers any of these people anymore. You know? And um, even, even life itself, it took, took its toll on uh, the greatest one. Muhammad Ali, right? I mean, he flew like a butterfly, stung like a V, but in his later days, life caught up with him like it does everyone else. And he lied silent. He lies silent in the grave. Number nine is this. Habakkuk finally kneels in the knowledge that God is sovereign and asks for God to, re to temper his wrath with mercy. Now, this is something that I like because it's something that we all ask, whether we know that we're asking it or not. We have to come to this understanding. God is sovereign, and we are not, which means he, he, he will always make the right decision. He will always do the right thing. His will will always be done, and it is always correct. We can't say that about ourselves. So when we talk about God as sovereign, it's that idea that everything that God ever does is always right, correct, and will be sustained. In that then, God, since I know that you're sovereign, I want to ask this one thing. When wrath comes, and I know it's going to come, he knew it was going to come, just temper it with mercy. Just let that part of you that's merciful come out so that the wrath is not as bad or not as long, or not as intense. Habakkuk 3, 2 says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. 
I think Habakkuk is saying, I have heard about all the things that happened before. I've heard about the stories of the Egyptian army being destroyed by Pharaoh. I've heard about the, the, the ground opening up and swallowing a couple thousand in Korah's rebellion. I, I've, I've heard about the judges and how the power came, a, came upon Samson and he pushed the pillars and destroyed more Philistines in that moment than times before. And, and he's like, I think what, in that moment Habakkuk is saying, I know all these great things and God display your, your power. And what he's saying is, God, do what you said you're going to do. Let that Babylonian army come in here. Let them sweep over these people. Let, like you said, it's going to happen. God, do all this. But God, remember to be merciful. Display your power, but remember to be merciful. Because there are some of us who are trying. There's some of us who are still trying to believe, who are still struggling through, who still want to honor you in the midst of all of this. Sometimes that's my prayer. God, when you come, just be merciful to your church. Be merciful to your believers. Be merciful to your wayward children who keep screwing up but love you. I understand we need to be disciplined. Just, just don't spank me too hard. You know, that's what I'm saying. I know I need it. I just, I don't, I, just give me one. Don't give me three. You know, <laughs> don't use the belt or whatever, you know. <laughs> use, use something soft and cuddly and nice, you know. <laughs> we pray to God to remember mercy. And I think that that's what God really wants to show. Because God does bring wrath. But ultimately, God brings mercy, and mercy triumphs over evil. And God's love triumphs over all of that. That's the best I can do with those two books. I hope it gives you an outline, a little bit in your mind, of what these prophets were thinking about and uh, what they were trying to display here. Nahum's all about Nineveh. Your time's come. God's raining down on you. You had your chance for revival. I'm basically just telling you bad things are getting ready to come. But Habakkuk is saying, God, I see some things. And I don't understand why. Please answer me. And God says, I'll answer you. This is what's going to happen. He says, I don't know, you know, but I'll step back. I'll kneel down. You're sovereign. Just be merciful. Just temper that with mercy. Let's pray.